the, the divide between those with and those without a college degree has become one of the most significant divides in American politics. And I think that the Democratic Party, if it's to renew its, its mission and purpose, rethink its, its political agenda and outlook, has to ask why it is it lost credibility with a large swath of working class voters and those without uh, college education. And I think it's connected to the meritocratic hubris. Hi there, this is Glenn Lowry. You have tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, at Substack, Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. I'm with Professor Michael Sandel, a distinguished political philosopher at Harvard University, author of many books. I remember being uh, really powerfully affected by liberalism and the limits of justice as a young non-philosopher trying to figure out how I could square my communitarian instincts with uh, the mighty John Rawls's theory of justice. This was an important book. Uh, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that. But uh, other things besides um, what money can't buy, the moral limits of the market, which has been translated everywhere and uh, also uh, is near and dear to my heart because while being an economist, I don't think uh, dollars and cents is the end all and be all of, of uh, ethical assessment. So uh, that book was important for me. And most recently, um, The Tyranny of Merit, What's become of the common good? And uh, Michael, I thought uh, we might spend some time talking about, about that. Uh, you wrote that book. It was published in 2020, two years ago, before uh, I take it the outcome of that presidential election. Is that correct? Right. But, well, before the, uh, it was after Trump was elected, but it was. Uh, no, I mean 2020 when he was defeated. That's right. It was before before Trump was defeated, yeah. So you did not know as you were writing uh, whether or not uh, in the midst of that pandemic uh, that we were all suffering under and that uh, amazing, uh, weird electoral competition between Biden and you didn't know what was going to happen. Right. You feared the worst, I take it. Well, my fears are not altogether dissipated, Glenn. Let me just step back. <laughs> Let me just, before, before we carry on, to say first, it's a pleasure to be in your company for this conversation. And I would say you're, you're, uh, you're an economist with the soul of a philosopher. So I appreciate those <laughs> kind remarks. But, Thank you very yeah, much, Michael. <laughs> but um, yes, I, th I think that the, uh, the, the fears that find expression in my book, The Tyranny of Merit, um, which came out in the midst of the pandemic and during the Trump administration, and my worries for democracy and for the deep polarization that afflicts our public life, I, I don't think that these clouds have lifted. So in that respect, I think that the tone and the, the concern and the worry about um, a society of winners and losers fracturing any effort to achieve the common good, those worries, I think, persist. So what is the core concern um, at the root of your argument in tyranny? It goes back, really, four decades, uh, during which time the divide between winners and losers, Glenn, has been deepening poisoning our politics and setting us apart. I think this divide has partly to do with the widening inequalities of recent decades, but it's not only that. It has also to do with the changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the rising inequalities. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the full bounty the market bestows upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle 
have no one to blame but themselves. So it's these attitudes toward success, I think, that have created a society of winners and losers. And that this explains a lot, I think, of why we are so deeply polarized. The winners don't deserve their success. They shouldn't be crowing about it. Uh, they didn't build this. You didn't build this. Isn't that what Obama said at one point in the <laughs> back in the ancient history of, of his presidency? You didn't build this. You, you, you know, you, you got there with the, the aid of many other uh, uh, influences. And uh, it, it's it's somehow poisoning the well, the political well, to have people running around who have done well, thinking about themselves as if, yeah, you know. Right. Well, we don't, we don't have enough humility, I think, generally in our public life. And Obama was trying to express something like the idea that I, uh, that I discuss in The Tyranny of Merit, though it, he didn't put it in, in quite the way that I think he intended. Here's how I would put the main point of the tyranny of merit plan. I would say that these harsh attitudes toward success and failure arise from a seemingly attractive principle, the principle of meritocracy, the ideal that says if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winning. Now, there are a couple of problems with this idea, or so it seems to me. The first is, we don't live up to it. Chances are not equal. We all know this. Children who are born poor tend to stay poor as adults. Social mobility, upward mobility across generations is not what we often assume it to be. And higher education is not the engine of upward mobility, we sometimes think. In Ivy League colleges and universities, despite generous financial aid policies, Glenn, there are more students from families in the top 1% than there are students from the entire bottom half of the income scale combined. So we don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess, but it seems to me there's a deeper problem, which is the ideal itself is flawed. It's flawed because it encourages the winners, the successful, to inhale too deeply of their own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And it leads them to look down on those less fortunate than them. This gets back to the point you were suggesting about humility. And so it's partly to do with the economy and the widening inequality, but it has also to do with these attitudes towards success that the meritocratic ideal encourages and cultivates. Paradoxically, if you think about it, the closer we come to a perfect meritocracy, if we could somehow achieve genuine equality of opportunity, that would not dissolve these attitudes towards success and failure, the, the hubris of the successful and the humiliation of those left behind. If anything, a more this is, Mike, this is Michael Young's point from that old book, right? Uh, exactly. Exactly. The, this And Michael Young coined the term, we forget this, Yeah. but Michael Young coined the term meritocracy back in 1958, with a little, a little book on the, on the rise of the meritocracy. That's what it was called. Yeah. Meritocracy, we use that as an ideal, as the name of an aspiration. When he coined the term, it was a dystopian story he was telling. He was, it was a good thing that the class system was breaking down and that young people from working class families had a chance to get a good education and to compete for jobs. He was all for that. But he glimpsed, he glimpsed the harsh attitudes towards success that would result insofar as people imbibed this sense of deservingness. And, and he was on to something. He predicted, actually, that in the year 2034, 
there would be a populist uh, revolt against the meritocracy. <laughs> he was almost <laughs> right, except that revolt came 16 years early. But was that revolt only... Was that revolt, the revolt of populism, uh, as reflected in Trump's uh, emergence in 2016, only or mainly uh, a reflection of the economic disparities of winners and losers? Or was it not also um, a reflection of a cultural contestation, not between economic winners and losers, but between people who control the megaphone of public communication? who live on the coast and who have certain modernist ideas about social life and those who might cling to their religion, their guns and their their uh, more conventional morality, you know, moral judgments about sexuality and all of that. Wasn't that also part of the story? How does that fit into your into your argument? I think it was both, Glenn. It was clearly both. And in fact, I think we sometimes distinguish too sharply between economic and cultural interpretations. As you have shown, economics is shot through with cultural assumptions and beliefs. So uh, part of what I try to do in The Tyranny of Merit is to break down this sharp distinction between economic and cultural interpretations. I think that the sense of anger and resentment and grievance against elites is at the heart of uh, Trump's appeal. Now, of course, a, a good part of his appeal, a lot of people were drawn to the racist, xenophobic, misogynist aspect of his appeal. There is no question about that. But the animus against elites, especially against the professional classes, and this connects, Glenn, with what you were saying about the the coastal elites. Uh, by th this represent, represented actually a change in partisan allegiances. Traditionally, working class vote, voters without a college education voted for the Democratic Party. And this was true in other countries too. In, in Britain, they voted for the Labour Party. In France, they voted for socialist parties. But in recent decades, this is split. Those who have a, a university degree tend to vote for center-left parties, the Democratic Party in the United States. And those without college degrees tend to vote uh, Republicans. And Trump was a big part of kind of consolidating this. You remember it, after one of those primary election victories, he said, I love the poorly educated. Yeah, I love that line, actually. Well, he was, he was on to something. I, I mean, I confess, I really love that line. <laughs> yeah, okay, but you know, you took note of that. Yeah, I did. Line. Because well, something was happening that pointed to something of political significance, which is that by 2016, the Democratic Party was more identified with the interests, the values, and the outlook of the well-educated professional class than with the blue-collar voters who traditionally, going back to the New Deal, provided the base of, of their support. And th this has happened in democratic societies, uh, a great many democratic societies. So I th the, the divide between those with and those without a college degree has become one of the most significant divides in American politics. And I think that the Democratic Party, if it's to renew its, its mission and purpose, rethink its, its political agenda and outlook, has to ask why it is it lost credibility with a large swath of working class voters and those without uh, college education. And I think it's connected to the meritocratic hubris of elites. The, the, because Trump, you know, Trump in a way was uh, economically, he's a wealthy man. So you could say, well, he was a kind of elite, 
And yet he was able to channel the sense of grievance against elites because the elites he targeted were elites who, who had long looked down on him. The elites in the world of finance, in the world of academia, in the world of the media, in journalism, the, the Manhattan elite. So one of, the, one of the few authentic things about Trump was his sense of being looked down upon, his ability to channel grievance. And that translated to the animus, the anger, the grievance against uh, well-educated elites, the professional classes, that a great many working people felt after years. And here's where it connects to the economy. It's cultural and it's economic, because many of these voters were the ones who were facing, who, who, who suffered from four decades of kind of neoliberal globalization project that involved the outsourcing of jobs, stagnant real wages over four decades. But it was connected, the neoliberal globalization project of the center right and center left establishment parties on both sides was connected with a certain uh, meritocratic hubris uh, among the elites who, who said the winners the winners deserve their winning. So here's uh, a, a devil's advocate. Yeah. The elites are elite because they're smart. They're elite because they're productive. Uh, granted that they didn't get there only on their own, but not everybody can do what it is that these Silicon Valley uh, tech entrepreneurs or these very clever uh, financial manipulators or uh, everything in between can do. It's not a it's not a level terrain. It's a terrain with extraordinarily uh, variable productivity across different segments of of the population. We we'd impoverish ourselves if we stifled these elites. We, we want to encourage the emergence of human excellence. Human excellence is not evenly distributed in the um, in the population. Too bad that it's politically inconvenient that these differences uh, emerge and express themselves. But the alternative is, dare I say it, socialism. You don't want that, do you, Michael? Well, but I've been, I listened closely to you, the devil's advocate formulation, Glenn, you just offered. And I noticed that running through it was a tension between the two sides of Glenn Lowry. And, <laughs> and I love the, the way in which you embody and give expression to these two tensions, because I listened carefully to the way you put it. You talked at the end about rewarding human excellence. I'm for that, for admiring human excellence. But in the run up to that, you were describing under the heading of productive contributors, what you called rightly clever financial manipulator. <laughs> and you know this side, it's this side of the Glenn Lowry who knows that a lot of what that goes under the heading of productivity in the sense of people who win outsized pay packages on Wall Street and yeah. hedge fund men, you know uh, that much financial activity, I mean, we, we only need to look at the meltdown of this, um, this cryptocurrency uh, company lately. I mean, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, people would have said, here's an example of the kind of productive genius that is innovating. So I think we have to take a step back. And I know you deep down agree with this, Glenn. We have to take a step back and ask whether, this here's the fundamental question, is the money people make the true measure of their contribution to the common good? And in the tyranny of merit, I argue that we need to ask that question, and I think the answer is no, because even even the the most enthusiastic libertarian laissez faire defender of free markets, which I know you are not, um, would be hard pressed to say that the market's verdict reflects true social contribution, because that would mean that the social value of a hedge fund manager is a thousand times greater than the social value of a nurse or a 
teacher or, or a physician for that matter. And that would be a hard case. Uh, that would be a hard case to make. So part of what I argue for in The Tyranny of Merit, and this is connected to the earlier book you mentioned, um, What Money Can't Buy, we need to uh, critically examine what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. And the, what we've done in recent decades is we have outsourced this moral judgment, and it is, after all, a moral judgment, to market. But the market's verdict on what's truly productive is deeply flawed. So we need to reclaim as democratic citizens, I think, the question of social value, the value of contribution, and debate it democratically rather than assume that the labor market's verdict at, uh, uh, adequately captures what's truly worth caring about, or to use your phrase, Glenn, what human excellence is really all about. You don't believe, do you, Glenn, that the, market's, that the market tells us what human excellence really is? No, no, I don't. And you're reminding me of these lectures I sat in nearly a half century ago, Michael, when I was a graduate student at MIT. Uh, about the labor theory of value, because uh, these guys, Paul Samuelson, Bob Solo, and others, Franco Modigliani, these were my teachers when I was an economics yeah. graduate student, were, were not, uh, you know, uh, right-wing uh, zealots, but they were also not Marxist. And their reaction to capital, that is Das Kapital's arguments about, the, about value being grounded in labor, were that... Uh, at the end of the day, that's that's kind of an incoherent theory, and and it's it's what prices are telling us is the outcome of these uh, massively complex interconnected uh, interests, assessments, uh, you know, technological possibilities, preferences, and so on like that, and they're giving us the information about the relative value in exchange. They're not; these are not intrinsic valuations, and it's a mistake to try to confuse the two. Right. But the, the concern is, and this is Hayekian, Michael, who will decide if I don't have the market deciding on what these values are, who will decide how, how, how will I, and, and then what will be the resource allocation consequences of political mechanisms making decisions about valuation instead of allowing the free interchange of uh, buyers and sellers to, to drive these prices? I grant you the prices are not a window on the soul of, of, of whoever is conveying the, the goods in question. Right. But there are, there are, this is what my teachers would have said, I think, and this is what yeah. I'm saying here now. Yeah. There are, there, there are best mechanism for solving the resource allocation problem in an effective and efficient way. We can then engage in redistributive activities of one kind or another, but, but we don't want commissars telling us about value. Well, we don't want commissars telling about value, I agree. I agree. But what I'm suggesting is that we, all of us, as democratic citizens, um, have views about this. And we should not insist that those views have no place in public discourse. One, one way they come in is, as you say, when we debate redistribution. But that's not the only way. They also come in when we set up the rules of the game within which markets operate. So, for example, we've, uh, we've transformed the rules uh, of financial regulation, I mean, over the, in the last few decades. And we were assured by the, uh, those who insisted on deregulating the financial industry during the 1990s and 2000s and by those who insisted that derivatives should not be regulated because the, there would be efficient market pricing if we just left it unregulated. All of this led to disaster. It led to the financial crisis of 2008. But what it highlights, and, and it also led to very distorted rewards, where some of the most uh, Able young people now are directed into jobs in the in you know the financial industry rather than into more productive sectors of the economy. Now, how much of the you mentioned earlier, Glenn, clever financial manipulation, but even putting aside 
uh, Ponzi scheme things like like this crypto company that fell apart. Even putting that aside, um, it's th th there have been studies asking the question: What portion of financial uh, activity and finance now looms much larger as a share of corporate profits and GDP than it did 40, 50 years ago. What portion of financial activity actually contributes to the uh, productivity of the economy, which after all is the purpose of finance, it's to allocate capital to socially useful activities, building new factories and, and creating jobs and building roads and productive things. What portion funds new productive activity, new assets, and what goes into speculating on the future value of already existing, sometimes synthetically created assets? And according to one estimate, this is by Adair Turner, who headed Britain's financial regulatory body after the financial crisis, about only about 15% of financial activity uh, goes into the funding of new assets, and 80, as much as 85% consists of speculation on the future value of existing assets. That raises the question, what should be the rules and regulations that, have, have, that shape the place of finance in the economy? and that determine the reward structure that sends young people flooding to these uh, uh, forms of employment rather than into starting businesses or entering into entrepreneurial activity or doing other, other useful things. So value judgment, what I'm suggesting is that first we, we need empirical facts. And you've made the point very powerfully as an economist. We need empirical facts rather than purely doctrinaire uh, ways of thinking about prices and values. But uh, value judgments have to shape the way we regulate, for example, the financial industry, as well as questions about how we should redistribute the results that any particular configuration of the uh, of the labor market produces. Okay, and I'm not a finance expert. I can imagine the response, well, what should the percentage be? You say 85, 15, maybe it should be 70, 30, maybe it should be 90, 10. Speculation is not productivity, I agree with you, but speculation has a function within the economic system of allowing people to hedge and right. spread provides, risk and things of this kind. Sure, it provides liquidity. The argument is it provides liquidity and liquidity, yeah. But the but we are paying a lot. Yeah. We are paying an enormous amount for marginal increases in liquidity and information. And uh, all I'm saying is, I'm not a financial expert. Uh, by no means, all I'm saying is that it is an only uh, redistribution that should engage values about what's Understood. productive. It's also the rules of the game, the rules that shape markets. That's really my general point. What about work? I mean, one of the things in the book that I was really taken by was your passionate uh, advocacy of acknowledging the dignity of people who, who work, who do manual labor, who work with their hands, who, ha who have crafts and skills that you don't need a college degree to get, but it takes years to acquire, who make things, who fix things. I mean, I'll, I'll just say this. We, we have this house here in Providence, Rhode Island, and we're spending a fortune trying to make it the home of our dreams. Yeah. And I'm looking at the guys who come in, the electricians, the carpenters, the plumbers, the, you know, the painters the, uh, who, who are... They're getting up at seven o'clock in the morning. They're going home at five or six o'clock in the evening. They're taking 45 minutes for lunch and they're on their feet. They're on their backs and their knees yeah. laboring the entire time. I'm sitting up here in my office making my living with my fingertips. Uh, and, you know, while I'm not a Marxist, it does give me pause <laughs> to think about the relative valuations that are implicit there because I'm paying them out of my back pocket. You know what I mean? I mean, so I, I, I see the point, but what would you do about it? 
how, how, you know, in an age of declining unionization and, uh, it's, you know, what, what can practically be done to elevate the, the social status yeah. attendant to non-college trained labor? Yeah, it's a hugely important question, and it's one that I raise but don't adequately answer in my book, The Tyranny of Merit. But here's one illustration of, of the problem that could, that, that could point to the beginning of a response. Um, uh, Isabel Sahil at Brookings uh, calculated how much the federal government spends helping young people uh, uh, go to get a four-year degree, go to university. And a few years ago, she said that it was about $164 billion a year. And then how much does the federal government spend supporting a vocational and technical training? And the, the answer she said is $1.1 billion a year, $164 billion to $1.1 billion. Right there you see a tangible expression of what you're referring to, the, the, that we really don't take seriously or accord dignity and honor to people who do not have a university degree, but who nonetheless make invaluable contributions to the economy and to the common good, people on whom we rely. So, for starters, I would say we need to invest um, much more uh, seriously in the forms of learning on which the majority of our fellow citizens depend. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget the fact that most people don't have a four-year degree. Nearly two-thirds of Americans do not. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life a four-year degree that most people don't have. So for starters, Glenn, I would say we need to invest seriously in the forms of learning and training on which people without a four-year degree depend to prepare themselves for the world of work and for that matter, of citizenship. That would be one thing. But if connected to that, because you're really asking a broader question, how can we renew the dignity of work? Here, and this goes back to a point I was making earlier about the close connection between economic and cultural dimensions of public life, and in this case, of, of dignity. Uh, I think that People, a great many working people without a college degree feel that in recent decades, the work they do, the contributions they make, are not honored and respected. And this has partly to do with the credentialist prejudice of elites looking down. We've talked some about that. I think it's also, in a subtle way, related to a kind of demoralization that sets in when the rewards of the economy are so skewed that hedge fund managers are making thousands, a thousand times more than people who work with their hands or who, um, who don't have a, a college degree. When the rewards that the economy confers are so out of relation to genuine value, that I think is demoralizing to the dignity of work. Put it another way, we, we have lots of debates about distributive justice. Yeah. But I think we also need to consider, and this is a point I make in the tyranny of merit, we also need to pay attention to what I would call contributive justice. And this is directly connected to the, the dignity of work. We need to remember that work is not only a way of making a living, it's also a way of contributing to the economy and to the common good and to win honor and recognition and social esteem for doing so. And I think 
any project to renew the dignity of work has to take account of this. You could call it cultural. I would say it's even a, a moral and spiritual dimension. We have, we have depreciated, maybe even denigrated, the importance of the contributions made by working people without a degree. And you mentioned the demise of labor unions. I don't think we should take that as just a fact of nature that we have to accept. I think any project of renewing the dignity of work should include measures to strengthen forms of collective bargaining and the voice of working people and empowerment. Here's one other dimension, Glenn. We, that we often take for granted, we don't hear much debate about this. About 63% of Americans do not have a four-year degree. Almost none of them are, are members of rep, uh, representative government. 95% of the members of the House and 100% of the Senate do have university diplomas. Uh, the percentage of members of Congress who worked in working class jobs, or manual labor or service jobs or retail jobs before they were elected, 2%. Even in state legislatures, only 3%. So we have effectively, in practice, not in law, uh, excluded working people and people without a college degree from the basic institutions of representative government. This, I think, is another expression of our failure to affirm the dignity of work. Don't I'm, you, don't you find that a striking figure? Glenn? It is a striking figure, I do. And I'm asking myself, what are the mechanisms? Who are the gatekeepers? What are the portals through which people have to pass I'm seeing political parties promoting uh, candidates and or not promoting them as the case may be. I'm wondering about how people raise money to mount campaigns and so on. And so exactly. yeah. why, why couldn't someone who's a, a tradesman or a shopkeeper or somebody like that successfully? I'm sure there are exceptions. I can't name them, but there must be a few. Yeah. But um, uh, this this uh, filtering, this uh, uh you know, screening activity that goes on. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, so I, I, I did have a question, uh, Michael, about uh, if, if merit is bad, uh, why isn't demerit also bad? Uh, I, I mentioned that in my note to you before we started talking. If I don't want to assume that the successful or making money and doing well have uh, deserved their success, don't I, uh, as a necessary consequence, have also not to assume that those who are uh, uh, lawbreakers or uh, people who are behaving in socially counterproductive ways uh, don't deserve their condemnation? They don't deserve to be thought less of in virtue of the fact that their, uh, their uh, activities are socially unproductive? I mean, how do you parse that? Uh, the flip side of not liking merit is not liking demerit, isn't it? Right. Uh, it's a good question. What about re what about retributive justice, for that matter, or criminal yeah. punishment? If if we have if we're skeptical about whether the successful deserve their success, shouldn't we? Doesn't that suggest we should also be skeptical that people who engage in criminal activity deserve to be punished? That's what I mean to ask. Yeah, and uh, it's it's a really good question. And in the case of uh, in the case of distributive justice, we often distinguish between uh, paying people more as an incentive for them to do socially productive things with their talents. That's the incentive argument. That's independent of. The, the deservingness argument, the, the meritocratic argument about desert. And in the case of criminal punishment, there's a parallel distinction. There are those who say the point of criminal punishment is simply to protect the public and to create disincentives to criminal activity. 
Whereas others say, no, the purpose of criminal punishment is also retributive to punish people for the bad character that criminal activity displays and reflects. And so if you, uh, if you held a view, so here, here's the question about criminal punishment. If you thought the purpose of the criminal law was to punish bad character, because bad character deserves, morally speaking, to be deplored and punished, then that would be, so to speak, a meritocratic theory of criminal punishment. Which you would be against. Which I would be against. I would be against, yeah. Which does not mean that to protect the public, we can never confine people uh, or cre create disincentives for people committing criminal acts. Okay, so deterrence and incapacitation, fine by you, but retribution, not so much. Well, not so much, or, and here's one, one more wrinkle, I would say that the form, the form that the uh, retribution should take should have an, if we take it, if, if it's really a matter of character, then punishment should have an educative function to improve the character of the, uh, of the perpetrator. But that point, uh, toward various proposals for restitution to acknowledge the wrong uh, that's been committed and to devote, to feel a sense of obligation and perhaps in some ways to enforce or encourage this, to provide restitution to the victim, aiming at a kind of moral education if we, if we really believe that the criminal activity is a mark of bad character. And the analogy in the case of, of distributive justice is, once we see that making a ton of money may be more a matter of, uh, less a matter of my own doing than a matter of my good fortune and circumstance and the society prizing the talents I happen to have and so on. What follows from that is, a sense of that those who succeed should have a sense of humility and of obligation to and to consider that their winnings are not only their winnings, but they have an obligation to share them with those who make their success possible or the wider community to cultivate a sense of indebtedness, a similar kind of moral education for the successful, an education in humility, in indebtedness. Uh, so that would be the parallel. That would be the parallel response. Do you, do you see what I'm suggesting? And in yeah, both, I think so. Do you, and so this reconnects with the moral and spiritual dimension of, of the way we regard success, or also in the case of criminal law, um, perpetrating you know heinous acts or deplorable acts. If we take that seriously, but recognize that there are lots of other factors bearing down on the perpetrator, not to excuse it exactly, but it's to say, insofar as there's bad character here, the response should be kind of an education in obligation. But I would say there needs also be a different kind of education in obligation uh, on the side of, of the successful. Let, let me ask you something else, yeah. because I detect in this notion of the common good, a presupposition yeah. of a community. Yeah. Is it a national or a global community that you have in mind? Well, because those are very different, they are, very yeah. different problems. I, I would say that we inhabit a range of communities, uh, including we are members of a national community. And insofar as we appreciate our indebtedness to a national community, it finds expression in various forms of patriotism. Now, that does not uh, mean that we are not also members of more particular and more expansive communities. The most expansive being the community of humankind, 
Certain of our moral obligations and duties flow from our membership in the community of humankind, or you could call it the global community. But that that does not, uh, for me, that does not suggest that our only moral obligation and duties are to humanity as such, because that would neglect the sense in which uh, national community is one way in which we're situated in the world in relation to our fellow citizens. But there are also more particular forms of identity, I think, that make claims on us, moral claims and civic claims, that may be more particular than our national identity, members of neighborhoods or uh, particular communities, religious communities. These make claims on us. So I, I think that moral and civic obligation needs to take account of the multiplicity of communities that can lay claim to our identity and our allegiances. And a lot of our moral dilemmas have to do with tensions that can arise among these uh, various claims. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about diversity, equity, and inclusion within the context of elite higher education. Are institutions moving in the right direction, in your view, to the extent that they self-consciously embrace uh, and attempt to act on the principles of diversity? Does the concept of diversity in practice uh, in elite higher education move the needle at all in the direction that you'd like to see it move in, in, in terms of opening things up? Uh, and uh, being less uh, less uh, selective and and exclusive. Well, I'm. Uh, I think diversity has its strengths and weaknesses as a force and as a principle in higher education. I do think that the classroom is enriched when there are students from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, in terms of race, ethnicity, but I would also say class background, where we are sorely lacking. Uh, but I would also include uh, international background. The fact that my classes, our classes, are teaming with students from different parts of the world does enrich the discussions of moral and political questions that I want students to grapple with. So, Diversity is a virtue of a vibrant classroom with competing views and multiple perspectives. I'm in favor of that. I'm also um, aware of um, the downside of diversity as it has come to be used as an ideological cudgel. It's interesting, the Supreme Court uh, in affirmative action cases, going back to the Bakke case, said that only diversity, diversity is the only rationale for affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And this distorted, I think, the whole discussion of the role of race in higher education and employment, because originally it was about redressing historical injustice and, mm -hmm. and their persisting effect. So, uh, Part of my uh, worry about the diversity rationale is that it has monopolized or colonized the space of moral argument about affirmative action and crowded out perhaps more difficult but also important moral considerations having to do with reparations uh, and, and addressing historic uh, injustice and their persisting legacy. So that's one weakness. But And it's a result of the court not allowing any of those arguments about injustice, only allowing for constitutional purposes diversity arguments. And this has another um, worrisome effect, which is if students come to uh, think that they must speak as representatives in the classroom, yeah, of this or that background. No good. That can narrow 
even the range of contributions students feel they, they can make. And that can, uh, that can have a, a, a dampening, even a deadening effect on a lively, vibrant, open discussion in the classroom. Uh, I, I don't think it has to be this way. And I teach courses where we deal, as you know, Glenn, with some of the most fraught moral and political questions of our day, including debates about affirmative action and meritocracy and who deserves what and wh what should be the role of race and ethnicity and class and university admissions and so on. We do discuss all of that and with competing voices. And you, on, uh, on a recent occasion, have been kind enough to be uh, one of our guests in the classroom. And we've had guests with a wide range of views, many of them different from mine. And the students hearing this, I think, are habituated and empowered to speak their mind. So I think it can be done. But I do worry um, when uh, I hear about students uh, who, um, who feel they need to speak as representatives of a certain view rather than in their own distinctive voice. Because a liberal arts education should be a place where students are working out and critically reflecting on their moral and political conviction, finding their voice, noticing the multiplicity of voices that may draw them one way and then another way. And I don't want to, I, I worry if that's narrowed uh, or, or in a way that um, prevents students from having that exploratory. Uh, experience. Well, you could say, and, and I have spoken in this spirit uh, previously, that reducing a student to their racial identity and then making them representatives of groups in terms of the counting of the diversity of the institution is already a very bad move. Why, why, am, I, why am I coming to a student as a black or as a gay or whatever when there's, there's so much more than that? They're not just a racial category, they, they, they have many, many dimensions to them. And maybe there's too much uh, attention given to the uh, racial identity dimension of uh, the, the personalities of students. Something like that. I, I mean, it, this whole discussion is embedded within a larger uh, frame uh, in terms of thinking about race and the transracial, humanistic, universality, cosmopolitan kind of idea doesn't get nearly as much, uh, you know, Anthony Appiah, I think of as a representative writer in the spirit doesn't doesn't get enough uh, play in my view. But I want to ask you something else, Michael, uh, as we kind of get to the end of the hour. Uh, you spend a lot of time in China, I gather. And uh, I know that your your work, your massive uh, open online course and whatnot is uh, followed. What's the what's your sense of how this question of meritocracy, stratification, and inequality is perceived and being dealt with uh, within uh, Chinese society, which will have a lot to say about what goes on, you know, in the fifty years uh, uh, out from now? It seems to me meritocracy looms and meritocratic competition loom very large um, in China. Um, in fact, we had a discussion in my class tomorrow, uh, uh, just uh, the other day, sorry, with uh, a couple of Chinese scholars. Uh, and we were talking about their system of university admission, which consists of one very high stakes exam called the Gakkao. And students prepare for it and cram for it for years and years because the score you get on the Gakao exam, which is offered once a year, one, essentially one opportunity, will determine whether you go to what they call a first tier, second tier, or third tier university, or none at all. That one score. And it, it creates enormous pressures on young people growing up. Our young people are subjected, the ones competing to get into top schools, to great pressure that I worry about. It's all the more, this competitive pressure, all the more intense in China. And it's considered, the score one gets, as the badge of 
honor and recognition and merit. Now, uh, there is a there's a backlash against the intense competitive pressures in China called the Lying Flat Movement, a movement by young people, and it went viral on social media, of young people who are just opting out of what they see as a kind of pointless, uh, hot, uh, pressured, stress-filled uh, way of not only of higher education, but also then of, of jobs and the very intense um, work culture. Uh, but in China, as in the United States, I find a, uh, an intriguing ambivalence. Because on the one hand, young people feel in a sense the toll that this competitive pressure takes on, on them, on the winners, the so-called winners, who emerge from the meritocratic tournament, the stress-strewn gauntlet that we have uh, made adolescents to be in our society, not only in China. The winners emerge wounded because by the time they arrive, and here I'm speaking about our students also, by the time they, they arrive at the universities that were the objects of their aspiration, they are so accustomed to hoop jumping, yeah. that it's hard to break that habit. It's hard to resist the credentializing, networking functions that our universities have taken on in a meritocratic, uh, an intense meritocratic market-driven society to explore, to reflect, to figure out what is worth caring about and why. That's what a liberal arts education should be about. And I worry that here, here's where I put it another way, Glenn. The tyranny of merit exerts its tyranny in two directions. Toward those who lose out, the working people whose dignity and honor is not what it should be in our society. But it also exerts a kind of tyranny, this system, on the winners because it turns higher education into an instrument of credential um, and a further opportunity rather than into an, an intrinsic good in a time and a place and an arena for exploration and critical self-examination. So I want, on the one hand, to see how we can renew the dignity of work, but also how we can redeem and renew the intrinsic purposes and ends that higher education should ideally serve rather than have it uh, converted into a giant sorting machine for a market-driven meritocratic society. Right. Okay, Michael. Thank you very much. The tyranny of merit, what's become of the common good? Oh, I have a message for you from Ernesto Cortez. Ernie Cortez? Yeah. He, he says they love the book. He's using it with his organizers and his training sessions, and he's looking forward to you coming. Is it back out? Have you have you done that? Uh, I have. Yeah. He he would have wanted to be here himself if he didn't have a conflict. I because he's been talking to me. I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about the book. I said, well, I'm going to actually be speaking with Michael. Maybe you'd like to join us. I, with your permission, I would have sought, but he was he had a conflict. But he wanted me to let you know that the book is really changing his life. He's a great man. He's the you know running the Industrial Areas Foundation, a community organizing uh, uh, foundation that has done tremendous work, especially organizing and empowering people in communities uh, around this country whose voices would otherwise not be heard. And he honored me by traveling out to Providence, Rhode Island, when they had a Fest Shrift conference on my career and uh, making a presentation because I've, I don't know, a half dozen times made the trip to Austin or San Antonio or Los Angeles or wherever he works in the Southwest yeah. to talk with this amazing organization, uh, Southwest uh, Industrial Areas Foundation yeah. that he heads up, uh, who are empowering people uh, in the workplace and the schooling and education and so on, be able to advocate effectively and educating them, educating yeah. them about how to act on behalf of the common good effectively. 
Exactly. So. Yeah. All right, Michael, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Glenn. I really enjoyed this.